complicated, you know, man. It's like a damn Rubik's cube, man. You like talking about that blue bread, man. Then you get to one side, then plug it, man. All right, James. Welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing, man? I am wonderful, Jack, and all the better for being here. How are you surviving the blizzard? Oh, I'm doing quite well. I guess blizzard is a, is a relative term for anything that happens in the South, but it is very, very cold here. Uh, as my viewers may have surmised, you're in Australia, so uh, weather's not quite the same, but I'm glad to have you on. <laughs> yes, it is a balmy 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and the flies are just about ready to carry me away, so I've got that going for me. So you and I have, have spoken a number of times. You've been, you know, kind of in the the background on my more like on my private group chat for quite some time. And you've been on a, a couple of the uh, the call in streams under a different name. You were smear for a while. Now you're you're going under under Agricola James. And so I want to kind of ask you, you know, why did you you know go about changing that name? You know, how does that kind of matter to you? I guess. At some point, the realization dawned on me. To quote Tolkien, I wish it hadn't come in my time, said Frodo. Neither do I, said Gandalf. But we aren't to decide time we are given, but what we are to do with the time given us. And as I looked around at my decrepit, <laughs> dying civilization, it dawned on me that I was perhaps in some way in doubt to do something about it. A king may move a man, a man may be the son, but when you reach your final judgment, it will not suffice to say that I was told to do such, or that wielding virtue was inconvenient at this time. And so it's a mantle that has been carried by many before me. And when I decided I might have some part to play. It's interesting you, you bring that up. One of the things that you and I have, have talked about, you know, at length over the past you know year or so is how this kind of like, you know, creeping civilizational decay has kind of hit everywhere in the Anglosphere. And there are certain things that are sort of the same everywhere. You know, we've talked a lot about the kind of, you know, global homogenization where everywhere is becoming an anywhere, you know, where things are kind of losing their regional characteristics. And the decay is part of that. But there's also a sense to which that, like, you know, the challenges faced by, you know, different countries are, you know, very different. And so I'm curious, you know, I know that Australia has been hit by, you know, some of the immigration problems that the rest of the West has. It's been hit by you know, problems with outsourcing, kind of like the changing economy. But what do you see as kind of the, the problems that are unique to, you know, where you are that are, you know, part of the broader decay, but maybe different, you know, from what, what we see in the U.S. or others may see in the U.K.? I was born in a very different time and place. I remember the before time, not only before the internet, not only before the fall of the World Trade Centers, all three of them. I remember growing up on the same ground that my grandfather and his grandfather and his father before him worked. I didn't see a tan person till I was a grown man. Australia has had a very good lot. It's not a ridiculous statement to use the term lucky country. For all intents and purposes, we may as well have had our own little isolated civilization on the Isle of Wight. It's something that in recent terms, recent times has been swept up amongst everything else. And like Sweden, in the way that high trust societies, naturally very high trust societies, have that weaponized gratuitously against them. The same thing very much happened to us. Up until 
the administration of people blame Keating for this in ninety six, but in reality it was Bob Hawke. Bob Hawke really was this sort of completing the work of Gough Whitlam. Gough Whitlam was elected in 1971, and he was the first sort of Australian Prime Minister to break with the last respects of the old order, the way things were. Prior to that point, it was a very protectionist country, even after the Second World War. The migration that was allowed was very was very Eurocentric. The very fact that they reserved the right upon the immigration test to test the migrants in any European language they saw fit. So naturally, if you were <laughs> an Englishman in good standing, you would take the test in English. If you were a Chinaman who had endeavoured to learn English, as far as you're concerned, they'd test you in Portuguese. Yeah, that's an interesting, it's interesting you bring up that kind of, you know, high trust nature to it. I, I think that that's one of the things that, and I'm a little bit, bit younger than you are and not in quite as much of a rural area, but, you know, growing up in kind of a small town setting, that's something you, you see, you know, that there was, you know, an era not that long ago, or even though the area was poor, there wasn't that much going on economically. There was this idea that, you know, everyone's kind of on the same page to have the same values. So I've mentioned a, a number of times one of my you know, good friend's fathers owns a funeral home in a, in a rural area. And it's interesting talking to him. You know, he's not a super political guy. You know, he's kind of conservative just temperamentally and because of the area. But, you know, he doesn't seem like the, he doesn't really go for the same kind of like, you know, theory sell stuff that, that I do. But it's interesting talking to him because the way that he talks about how his business has changed over time is really interesting. Because one, he says that funerals don't really happen in the same way that they used to. You know, it used to be that the reason there were, and in the South, there was two, you know, one for you know the black residents, one for the white funeral homes was because, you know, when someone died, it was an event, you know, people were expected to, obviously there was a service at church, there was a viewing, there was a whole kind of series of rituals went along with that kind of passing time. But somewhere in the last generation or two, that's disintegrated and people don't, one, they don't come for funerals at all. You know, more and more people are, are dying alone. And more and more people are, are, even if they do have parents, they're sort of, you know, doing the quickest, cheapest funeral they can and then, you know, moving on. They're no longer connected to the area and connected to the community. Uh, but also, you know, the kind of the deaths you see are different. You know, in, in a rural area, a lot of people died in, you know, farming accidents, industrial accidents, hunting accidents, if we're being perfectly honest. And, you know, those are, those are tragedies individually, but those are sort of part and parcel of living a life connected to land, right? It's a dangerous thing. Uh, but now, right, it's more and more, you know, drugs, suicide, or just, you know, simple obesity related stuff. And I think that, you know, it's all too easy for, you know, people, myself included, to kind of lionize these more rural, these more working class areas of, you know, the Anglosphere, you know, and, and it, you sort of see this kind of like proto-Soviet <laughs> art style, this proto-Soviet, you know, kind of like reverence for the working man. And don't get me wrong, right? Like the working man has a place in society. But I think that a lot of people don't realize how much that degradation is kind of seeped into all layers of society. And they just maybe don't see it as kind of a, you know, a middle class laptop worker. Do you think I'm on to something there? It could be the case. I... The, the breaking down of social fabric, for that matter. I was talking to my wife last night about the story of her great aunt and grandmother's sister, how they owned a property that, you know, her, her great uncle would work and did this over the years. At some point, they got, as, as age takes them, they were too old to really continue working the place. And their kids were so determined to just, all right, into the home, where you go, uh, look, you're going to die soon anyway, give us the inheritance now. Um, even the intergenerational bonds have broken down to that degree. As far as working class people go, it is a strange one. 
I there is this lionization um, in this kind of you know in this uh, French Enlightenment type way. Of, you know, these these French aristocrats writing poetry and going to fraternize with these these uh, industrial peasantry. The idea of like this is this is the epitome of man. It's not quite that anymore. But but I have I have found that in our housing commission areas, the scumbags you see. I spent almost twelve months in Latin America, and I lived amongst them. I learned their language, and I I was some fairly well accepted, although of course hated by some. But I didn't see the level of scum and treachery that you get amongst even the most ordinary housing commission in Australia. These, so just one thing before you go on, people. And, I, and I don't want to interrupt your thought, but you know, for those of us who, who aren't familiar with Australian terms, is housing commission, is that like, uh, like social housing, like would be called like Section 8 in the US, like government subsidized? Yeah, that's exactly right. It is it is heavily subsidized. Their weekly rent is something in the way of like sixty or seventy dollars for a house that's usually very poorly constructed and constructed a long time ago. But these institutions stand and serve and the waiting lists are something amounting to fifteen or twenty years. And they absolutely have conglomerated into these intergenerational hell holes. Back when I was quite a bit younger, I was uh, working as a construction laborer and I they implemented the work for the dole program. Now, essentially, their dole payments would remain the same, but they would do some sort of very menial job to, uh, to, to earn that. Otherwise, they'd have their payments restricted. This was met with a strange sort of backlash of howling and so on of like you can't expect these people to work for money however in that in in where i was working i was acquainted with not one not two but literally three generations of terminally unemployed people a 17 year old son a you know 40 something year old father and a 60 something year old grandfather not one of them had worked a day in their life well and that's and that's actually a an interesting you know an interesting thing in all of this that i i have an unreleased episode with with ed dutton it'll probably come out in a, in a week or so and one of the things that he talks about is this idea of you know, mutational load. And the idea is that as the kind of like harsh pressures of, of reality increase over or decrease, excuse me, over time, you know, you sort of, you lose the benefits of like small e eugenic forces, right? And the population starts to pick up more and more mutations and these kind of compound. And these are things that in a previous era would have been death sentence, but due to modern medicine kind of get to carry forward. And I think about that a lot in kind of a social setting, you know, where government programs and kind of the, the welfare state, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not a social Darwinist, uh, but they do sort of enable this sort of bad behavior and they enable this bad behavior to procreate, you know, and, and whereas before it's like uh, what social welfare may have been a workhouse, you know, which, which Victorian you know, workhouses were sort of <laughs> like infamously horrible places, <laughs> you know, no one wanted to be there, you know, versus the government housing, which don't get me wrong, it's terrible. Like I wouldn't want to live there, but it sort of enables this kind of like just baseline survival level of living. And I think that, look, like I, I don't believe that the economy is everything, but I think there's something to be said for the fact that, you know, when there's very little decent gainful employment to be had, you know, more and more people just kind of realize like, well, why would I work at, you know, the big box retail store? I might as well just take the dole. And I think that it's impossible to kind of remove that from, you know, that kind of like intergenerational uselessness that you see. I, I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Zoomers, I will get back to them. 
I have a special commission for you lot, so don't you mind me. I've, there, there once upon a time, we descended from hard men. We descended from real men. And I talk about this in my latest substack. I allude to this, and I will go on to continue the hagiography of Arthur Philip, William Bly, Matthew Flint as Captain Cook. But once upon a time, if you stole something more than the value of six shillings, you were sentenced to transportation. If it was more than the value of 20 shillings, you were sentenced to death. And the idea of, like, now you can commit... You, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Here in Australia, do you know what the judicial recommended sentencing is for a man who commits a rape of a girl between the ages of four and 14. Do you want to guess what that sentencing period is? Uh, I'm going to guess, and this is a genuine guess. I'm not trying to make a joke here. I'm going to guess it is 10 years. It's four. It's four without any extenuating fact. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and that's kind of the, become the standard things. Once upon a time, people were hard. They understood the hardships of life and they lived amongst them. If they were to... <laughs> Thomas talks about this. This idea of like, oh, you know, we just incarcerate people and this magically makes them better. It's like, no, actually, uh, maybe some people, maybe some people just aren't uh, cut out for this plot. But I won't, I don't mean this in this fed posty way. Like the average man possesses so little virtue, so little valor, that he is, he has the agency of algae. But more than likely, this man in a pious age would have exuded some level of piety. This is not, I don't tend to say that all these, uh, as much as my coward sympathies are, I don't necessarily say that all these people are predestined to hell. I do, however, say that they have not seen a decent leader for many, many generations. And I think there, there's something to that. You know, I'm not the I'm not the biggest fan of, of Trump, but I find the man interesting. And I think the reason that I find him interesting is because he commands loyalty in a different way than American politicians have for a very long time. And I think part of that is that he he sort of recognizes the core of politics, right? Which is to punish your enemies and reward your friends, even if a kind of through a through a glass dimly. You know, he's not good at it, but he sort of instinctually gets it. But the thing that makes me hate him, and, and don't get me wrong, I am not a, a Trump supporter by any means, is the fact that he commands that loyalty, but will not stick his neck out for the for the people who essentially sacrificed for him. You know, like he he's his hardest supporters, right? The people who kind of went to the mat for him during the electoral justice protest are uh rotting in solitary confinement, and he's effectively done absolutely nothing for them. And I mean, it's sad that that is what kind of passes for, you know, leadership as in kind of a strong man in the West, you know, it's pathetic, right? To me, I, I think about, you know, Bolsonaro, you know, this supposedly ultra hardcore, you know, based right wing leader, you know, sitting in KFC, eating fried chicken in Florida, while his, his country is, uh, been fortified. I have to be careful for the sake of <laughs> you. You understand uh, yeah. my meaning, but yeah. you know that's sort of the the perfect example in that of you know like these these men who are the kind of best leaders we've got at the moment are are very much incapable. And, and one of the things that I I think about a lot that's sort of a, a white pill buried in this, you know, as you talk about you know people who are kind of acquainted with the harsh realities of life, is that uh, those kind of harsh realities are coming back whether we like them or not. You no, know, but there's been this this story recently of the you know the American 737 that uh, you know essentially shook itself apart partially over Alaska, you know, and the response to that is well, push harder ahead on the diversity agenda, and <laughs> yeah, this this was in fact caused by a lack of transgender black woman, Jack. Don't you know this? Well, well, exactly, and so my point is that you know the 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 regime has damaged its ability to perform. You know, it is getting worse at 
doing the things that it does. And on one hand, I that that's generally good because I don't like the regime. I don't want them to be in power. But I think that we have to realize that, you know, it won't just be things that we like or things that we dislike. There will be things that we enjoy, things that we kind of take for granted that will suffer in this as well. I think that's what we're seeing in places like Brazil and, and South Africa. And so, you know, those kind of hard times are coming back, albeit in a small way, you know, the economy kind of sucks. There's no two ways about that. But I think that, you know, that sort of harshness is necessary to be the kind of men we need to be, if, if you see what I'm getting at. It absolutely is. I will tell you a story. I have a good friend of mine. He works in a coal mine here in the valley in which I live, the Hunter Valley, is notorious, at least in its modern times, for being one of the largest worked coal reserves in the world. One of the larger mines here, he works as an, he's, he's technically an electrician, but he went on to get his certification as an electrical engineer. He was working under a mining superintendent, sorry, an engineering superintendent. This guy was the shot caller, the check signer, the place where the buck stopped in a mine that turned over some unfathomable number of thousands of millions of tons a year. He was not my friend, but the superintendent was dismissed because he continued to use company vehicles for private reasons. This man was a South African, um, and it's safe to say he was not descendant of the Dutch persuasion. This man could not comprehend how he was caught because every time he left sight in a company vehicle for a personal reason, he could not believe that the aluminium foil that he had delicately wrapped around the GPS transponder was insufficient to block its signal. <laughs> yeah, what do you say? Yeah, what do you say? The, I think that it's, I don't know, it's very clear that you know, these kind of trends are, are continuing. And, and you and I were talking, you know, before we went live, uh, just about kind of the weather, you know, because it's extraordinarily cold where I am, unseasonably cold. Uh, and, you know, kind of likewise for you. And, and we, we both kind of mentioned that, you know, our areas are on a kind of a re return to the mean when it comes to drought. You know, I remember growing up as a you know a boy, the, everyone was talking about the fact that you know the, the aquifers were low, the it's been a bad drought for a long time, and I remember you know as a kid, that was always blamed on on global warming. You know, the, the earth is drying out, you know, the topsoil is going away, and it's just going to be you know dry, cracked desert. And what's especially interesting in that is that now, right, we've returned to the mean. We've had a couple years of flooding. Well, and the answer is, well, now it is not global warming, but climate change. And, you know, the earth is mad at us, you know, look at what we've done to the environment. And, and I don't mean to say that environmental degradation is fake. That's not my point at all. But it's to say that no matter, you know, the results on the ground, the cause is the same. You know, it's, it's climate change it and the solutions is. are the same. And I think that in all things, you know, the, the migrant issue is one of them. It doesn't matter what happens. The answer from our elite is the same. You know, they will say literally no matter the case, this is what we need. I know that not necessarily in your area, but Australia has been having a, a housing crisis, correct? Oh, yes. Yes, we have. The pitiful and terrible pitched battle between the capitalized and the uncapitalized. This idea came about sometime in the 2010s of every family should have an investment home, borrow against your existing mortgage, and you too could have an investment property in which some poor wagey can live and pay off whatever you want to do for your retirement. Stockland is perhaps one of the largest commercial companies here. They own all the malls, and they have now gone about building <laughs> pods functionally, 
<laughs> pods for those rentoid wages that need to uh, that, that need somewhere to live. And the idea is that that um, you know, like you just if you just keep pouring more capital into these investment holdings and isolating the uh, the land holdings more and more within the hands of more and more capitalized, that this is going to solve our crisis. Oh, and you can't forget, we still need record levels of migration. Well, right, exactly. And I think in this, it's very clear that the relationship between you know us and our purported leaders has, has broken down. You know, look, like I'm a realist, I'm not naive. The idea that you know, all of our leaders at a time in the past were these just like wise, august men who had the only the, the benefit of the people at heart is is not true, right? People are selfish. Sin is a part of human affairs. There's no ways around that. But at the same time, uh, the idea that all elites through history have always been this bad is not true. It's absurd. It's clearly not true. You know, the hatred that the people who rule over us have for the kind of heritage populations they rule over is is, is clear. And I wrote an article about this, uh, and I couldn't think of a title for it. Uh, I, I really couldn't think of a title for it that was not incredibly profane. So I just titled it Why Liberals Are Bad, because, I mean, that is kind of what I meant. <laughs> but in that, I basically describe why I think that our you know, elites, our ruling class, are so interested in covering up history, why they are so interested in you know, making the past go away. And one of the things that I think about in this is the fact that they don't want a basis of comparison. You know, they don't want you to be able to compare them to the people who ruled countries like yours and mine 100, 150, 200 years ago. Because say what you will about those men, otherwise, they were much more impressive human beings. Like, I don't really like Lincoln personally. You know, I, I think that he did bad things. But you have to admit that the man was impressive. You know, there was a certain kind of like will to power about him that you don't see in our modern elites. You know, these kind of like bizarre, effeminate, you know, like bio Leninist trash heaps. But anyway, sorry, James, I cut you off. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. No, the bio Leninist dumpster fire. Yes. On the topic of impressive men, it's a very, I've been doing a bit of reading lately um, about the age of exploration particularly into Arthur Phillips, Captain Cook, and William Bly, being great Australian heroes and the need for the revival of not only historicity itself, but the heroism therein. The providential hand that guided the expansion and height, the zenith of the British Empire, that led Captain Cook to be the greatest maritime explorer that ever lived, the, the distance he covered, the number of times upon which his ship was faced with reefs or shoals and it would be turned about by the gentlest puff of wind, a situation that would have wrecked any other ship. Cook was not the first to go in search of the Northwest Passage, that is, the sea routes around the top of Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but he was probably the most uh, prominent person to begin that. When Cook reached the Beaufort Sea through the Bering Strait after stopping in at a small Russian trading post, he was met with unfathomable walls of ice, some as many as 40 feet thick. And the passage existed, but he was never going to find it. Our ice records, the ice coring techniques that they use, indicate an unbelievably thick and cold season number of years between most of the um, sort of from about most of the sort of the early nineteenth century, where the estimated temperatures were as much as four and a half to five degrees below the 700 year average. The hand of Providence 
may have guided Cook in his discovery of many of the Pacific Isles, Australia, New Zealand. But at some point, that was turned off. And whatever the future, where, wherever in the future lies, it was not there. And it was almost as if Cook had come to its impasse in the Beaufort Sea, as had Great Britain, as a power on the world stage. Cook, unfortunately, he had, out of his five children, only three lived to their teenage years. He'd been away for 16 and spent only four and a half at home. He's, after he was unceremoniously murdered on Hawaii, his three boys would grow up and not even do that without a father. The youngest son, Hugh, died at the age of 12 of scarlet fever. And his two older boys, James and I'm blanking on the other one, forgive me, were both lost in what was accounted as the most tempestuous gale the Atlantic had ever seen. James's body washed up on the Isle of Wight some two weeks after. And thus was the end of the line for such great men. What we've been resigned to have, the, think of all the magnificent and brave souls that were butchered and damned in the Great Wars. It's almost scarce a wonder that this age in which we live could quite easily be defined as an age of indolence and cowardice. Well, I do think that, and maybe this is, you know, what I, I was trying to get at that is that we're sort of, you know, the age of the age of advent, adventures coming back, whether we want it to or not, you know, and I, I think about this, you know, talking to the South African guys who are certainly ahead of us on the curve of social decay, you know, is that certainly there's something to mourn in that, right? You know, we, we see a lot of beautiful things go away, but there is something exciting again. You know, there's this feeling and you see it, there's this kind of meme that goes around millennial and Gen Z circles where it's like, you know, born too, born too late to explore the world, you know, born too early to explore the stars, you know, so all we have is the internet. And I think that there's, there may be something to that, but I think that the, you know, the end of history is just in is, time to browse memes. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 That idea. Right. But I think that the, uh, to pardon me for butchering this phrase, but like the end of history is ending. You know, history is is coming back and with a vengeance. And, you know, when you look at, at men like, you know, at men like Cook or, you know, you know, Sir Raleigh, you know, uh, people like that who are kind of in these kind of like explorers, these men did not have particularly pleasant lives, you know, but they were kind of great. And I think that there's there's something to that, you know, that we we sort of have been gifted, you know, like like Tolkien's characters with an opportunity to actually do something with our lives. You know, and I think that there is a there's an attitude that I'm even guilty of that kind of looks back on the prosperity that our parents and grandparents has had and basically says like, oh, why couldn't that be me? You know, like I'd rather live in the easy time. Why, why don't I get my chance? And I think that, that that's sort of missing, excuse me, that's sort of missing the point, you know, because the, that, that prosperity was artificial. That prosperity wasn't real. It required, you know, it required us to burn the seed cord of civilization, you know, the kind of generational wealth that had been built up. And, you know, fair enough, you know, that isn't good. I wouldn't, I'm not glad to be in this position, but it's like, it does at least, there's an opportunity for heroic action in it that I think that uh, is good for men to have. It's good for men to have something like that. Once upon a time, in a more rightly ordered age, you and I, Jack, we'd have held commissions in His Majesty's Navy. We would have had, there would be a place for us to go. There would be a desire to gather in those capable men, people who uh, the Yoki would come to define as the culture-bearing strata. They, the age of exploration has ended. With all its romanticism, the Faustian yearning for infinite space. But 
that doesn't necessitate the end of certainly not the end of history. No one has been more bitterly revered than Fukuyama. This tardiest explorer pushing hard across the plains, we stand abreast a world that is entirely uncontacted, a world entirely to be explored. This, as much as I too yearn for the halcyon, it is absolutely the case that our adventure lies ahead of us because no one in a thousand years of our memory stands upon what we look at so viscerally and so really today. Yeah, there's something, I don't know, there's something to that. You know, I, I'm sort of uh, obsessed with cyclical history. You know, and I realize it's in vogue now, but it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, in the two episodes or the two series I've done with my friend, Sean Slaughter, and then with Luthemplar on books, right? Both uh, Book of the New Sun, right? Gene Wolfe, and then the Chinese science fiction book, The Three-Body Problem and its its sequels, which does have a name as a whole collection. I just cannot remember it. You know, there's this idea of civilizational stages and cycles that I find fascinating. And I do think that this is something you even, you know, you see in, in scripture as well. You know, this idea that this kind of like ebb and flow of you know, civilization, ebb and flow of, you know, national character is, is, it's a real force, you know, of, of human affairs. And I think that, I don't know, I think that it's one of those things that it's not particularly comforting to think on, you know, in, in the, in the U S we have this kind of like odd, you know, Zionist dispensationalist Protestant theology. And I bring this up just not to, you know, have a digression into that, but only to say that there's this desire to say like, Oh, you know, things are going badly. It's all going to end, you know, but I'll be whisked, whisked away at the last moment. You know, patriots are in control. Q will save us. And <laughs> I think that those ideas are, are linked, you know, because this idea that I don't want to go through the, the downward cycle. You know, I don't want to kind of gird myself for the, for the adventure, right? And I don't know, to me, I always find that it's like, okay, maybe it's understandable, but it's a very kind of like feminized way to think about it. You know, it's a very just kind of like weak wristed or limp wristed, I guess, way to think about it. Escapist eschatology and defeatist eschatology are merely a hand's breadth apart. This idea, whether it be we're all taken away in some celestial rapture or what, the idea that we should somehow just prostrate ourselves before the enemies of civilization and accept death. I have said this to a few friends of mine in my best attempts to rile their spirits. How are you so sure that endowed as you are, that upon your judgment, you will not be tried with cowardice? A man of agency and action and the ability to confront the men who wield the levers that can turn the machinery of time. How could you look upon such an opportunity and be negligent in your duty? Right, definitely. And I think that that is, that there's sort of, there's sort of an archetype that I think of, you know, the, the, the Anglosphere is quite familiar with. And that's the kind of like the fight in the face of defeat. You know, I, I think of, you know, movies like, you know, Zulu, you know, kind of Rourke's Drift, you know, it's the battle. And obviously, you know, on one hand, those men, those men pulled through, they survived against the odds. You know, there, there are others though, as well, which is kind of like the noble last stand. And in American you know, mythology, the classic example is the Alamo, right? Oh, you know, I was going to say Custer. 
Oh, actually, both will work, right? You know, those are yeah. similar, similar examples, right? Uh, of kind of like a, a small group of men against impossible odds, you know, essentially ref refusing to give in. A and either one of those is, is kind of noble and masculine. You know, either you, you essentially kind of grin and bear it and are, and are swamped, you know, in, in which case uh, it's honorable, you know, or you make it out and you're a hero, you know, in either case. And I think that that is, you know, viewing things narratively, you know, viewing things in, in a way in which, you know, you have certain obligations you are expected to meet. You know, I think of this term, you know, like, you know, being an Englishman and look, I'm yeah, maybe genetically slightly English, but you know, that's not a term that resonates for me in the same way it does for others. But I look at that from the outside and there, and there's something to that, this idea that there is a standard of conduct that you ought to strive to achieve, you know, and if you aren't, there's something wrong with yourself that you need to, to fix. And I think that, again, that's a reason that you know, this kind of idea of heroism and narrative is so important because it provides you that inner person, that personal measuring stick of like, oh, like I am not living up to my forefathers. And I guess that does kind of go back to why our elites are so desperate to get rid of these men. You know, they don't want to be held to a standard. And I think that, you know, I don't want to be so you know, grandiose as to say that, you know, in a previous era, I'd be, you know, some kind of important person. I, I think that I'm, you know, a relatively normal man and have normal time. But I do think there's something to be said for the fact that if we look at how the our, our previous generation of elites, like a man like Lee, you know, Robert E. Lee, how he viewed himself. He viewed himself in relation to previous heroes. You know, he was obsessed with Napoleon. He's obsessed with Washington. And his entire life tried to live up to those standards and felt that he had failed. And so looking back on him now as a man, you can say, oh, he was an amazing military commander. You know, he was a great educator, a, a talented engineer. And say like, oh, he's one of the ones that I'd want to imitate, you know, as an American Southerner. And uh, I think that that, you know, that kind of provides us, you know, a, a blueprint for how we should act in kind of these uncertain times. You've touched on this with your discussions of irony, the layers of irony under which uh, you can say the Zuma, the millennial does this too, hides. I have effort posted entirely too much in your chat amongst others. But this idea of the the Faustian man's yearning for infinite space has manifested the novel, the cinema, the novel of which few good ones were written after, say, the Great War. No true painter after Rembrandt. No, well, technically, Spengler says Menzel, he can have that. No true composer after Wagner. Of the movies that have been made, you could count on one hand the number that are worth watching. And as for photography, probably even less than that. But there is one thing, there is one art form that persists in this current age, as odd and curious as it may seem, is the mimetic. Now, the mimetic is remarkable, for the mimetic cannot lie. The meme, that is. This is the fundamental answer as to why leftists cannot meme. All that irony, all that humor, gives you license to do and say things that you otherwise couldn't, lest you bring the ire of powers that be. However, here's the problem. All these great men, they were not ironic in the least. Irony is not perhaps the antithesis of heroism, but it is certainly the current that runs contrary to it. It is, what is our role? To stand aboard the edge of this current form, we look back upon the, we look back upon those most admirable men and heroes with enough irony that we may perhaps still be safe until a time, much like Garvin's rocket, 
we can be prepared to cast that off. But uh, this is, unfortunately for us, much in the same way that our elites have been consumed by drinking their own Kool-Aid, uh, this is the ultimate vindication of Pareto. They have, have become these bio-learners bio monstrosities. Or you go down the road of doing what we do and hiding behind aliases, as you and I both do, or hiding behind irony in the mimetic. As Jack Burton always said, the internet is a tool, not an end. Well, like many things in life, I think I stole that from from Dave, the distributist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's a remarkable man. There's no shame in that. Well, it, it's funny. There, there's it, there's sort of a, a a long dialogue that goes on between Dave and I, where we both enjoy each other's work, but very rarely have the chance to directly talk. Uh, so we do have these conversations, but sort of uh, mitigated through podcasts talking to other people. Anyway, that's maybe a, a discussion for another time. But I, I we think seldom the, have the opportunity to fillet each other directly. Uh, I'm going to move on from that. Well, one of the things that <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that uh, I think is interesting about about irony, right? Is there's this this sort of idea that you know you're 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 doing things as a joke because to do them sincerely would be would be shameful you know and i think about this of it's sort of this kind of like poison of self-awareness you know there's this idea that, i was only pretending to be retarded <laughs> well right but even like you know I, i'm sure you've you've been to a you know a concert or a music event where everyone has their their phones out and it, it sort of ruins it right because then no one is enjoying the event they're they're sort of part of a performance you know they're they're pieces of that because they are being observed you know nothing is of the moment there's kind of another layer of awareness and another layer of i guess another layer of observance maybe that doesn't quite make sense but to the yeah, whole well, thing there absolutely is something disingenuous about it uh, another could, could i if i may just jump in with this this phenomenon as well this bizarre advent of the, the lifestyle YouTuber or TikToker, like recording every little aspect of their day, that you too may participate in just a little morsel of simulacra. You too, by the power of this screen, may know what it feels like to live a normal life. And, and while you vicariously just enjoy that hit of dopamine, uh, you're, you're sitting in some disgraced state. Um, you know, it's the middle of the day and you should have gone to work. No, no, definitely. But I think that in the same way that I, I, I you know, that, that, you know, music events kind of performance is, is ruined by a, uh, by becoming a performance or in that way, you know, there's a, there's a non-present third party. I think you see it in, in cultural expression as well. You know, I know that you're, you're not from New Zealand. That's the reason I'm talking to you in the first place is that you're not from New Zealand. But Thank you. I appreciate that. When when you look at something like you know like the Hakka, right, which is ostensibly a cultural outpouring of you know the the natives there, it's it sort of become this weird fake and gay thing because it is performative. You know, it is something now done in front of camera. It's something done in you know chambers of parliament, and it's not the same thing that it once was. You know, it's become something else. It's become part of like a an identity to be observed by others. You know. Instead of, you know, when a culture is kind of healthy, unironic, completely unself-aware, these are just the things you do, you know? And so you have this odd portmanteau of, you know, ostensibly Maori men, you know, playing a game invented in England, you know, speaking a language invented in England, but deciding like, okay, well, you know, this is what we do now. And I don't know, it's not, to me, that seems like something very different. And I think that that kind of, that kind of irony is just it's poisonous and I try to exercise it from myself, albeit unsuccessfully, I guess. It's so astroturfed and strange. I don't 
they've done, they've done much of this year. They they've tried to sort of cause this revival of in to use a polite term, indigenous languages, of which there functionally aren't any. You know, even down to the things that were named after Aboriginal or Maori places, they they aren't. It's it is it, this is a jettisoned reconstruction all the way down. And that if they think there is anything, and don't get me wrong, like I'm not apathetic, it's the old joke. Like the racist community doesn't care what you are as long as you're racist. Um, but but there's no there's no connection to the past left for these people. There's no there's no language or anything anything that really sort of no custom. And the only solution there is to blame the white man. I had another point I wanted to address, but it has since slipped through my fingers. That is a that is a weekly occurrence of the Jay Burden show. So uh, don't worry about <laughs> fill it. it. Quick, get the bingo card. Fill that out. Yeah, exactly. I, I have a not to just reference my own content, but I have an un an unaired episode where I I went on another person's podcast, and in the middle of it, I dropped a pen and it audibly made a loud noise. And my first thought is not, oh, I hope this doesn't ruin the recording. It's, damn it, another square on the bingo card. Uh, so I've been, <laughs> I've been fully, I've been fully longhoused by this stupid <laughs> bingo card. Do you do you remember on your previous point how you started that? Uh, well, I was saying something about about kind of like irony and and when something becomes performative, you know, when something is done in front of a camera as part of a, like a performative identity for other people to see instead of an outpouring of a real culture, you know? And I think that, that my memory at uh, some point I, he's sorry, go on. I just want to say, I think that Gen Z is kind of especially prone to this, you know, whereas kind of everything is turned into essentially like a bio tag and in much the same way, you know, Gen Z is kind of infamous for having all of these like Xeno pronouns and fake genders. I think that a lot of other things like certain political or religious or ethnic identities to Gen Z is sort of this, a similar thing. But anyway, sorry, carry on. No, they absolutely are. And, and this is the great tragedy of Generation Z. They, they are so lost. They're so cast adrift. Excuse upon... me. What, 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 did, what did you just say? Generation Z? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, this, is, this is the great problem. With isn't, it, isn't it Generation Z, Z for you? Uh, yes, it is, but you threw me off. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I couldn't resist. Carry on. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's like if you say, if you say uh, Alabama, I will copy you. Uh, but if I'm reading it to myself, I will pronounce it Alabama. It just seems more natural to me. And I, that's even a bit less different because that's you know a place name. But um, sorry, sorry, please carry on with your real point instead of uh, me making fun of your your pronunciation. <laughs> so. So at some point, right, they're going to get, they're going to scroll through TikTok and on the 20th hour of this week in one particular app, they're going to see some like insufferable, like just putrid looking tattooed bearded man with uh, steroidal muscles telling them how to truly be masculine. And look, I'm, I'm with a stone axe building the worst little hut you've ever seen in the woods and therefore therefore you should you should come with me i see this with with uh, I, I i don't want to say his name save getting you in trouble but there is a this interesting sort of resurgence of uh nat Sox in the australian youth um and don't get me wrong uh they are they're impressive they're inspiring they have balls uh, I grant them that. The way in which they come to confront the Victorian police, that's not a clue, um, is remarkable. And the way in which they order themselves is good, except for the fact that you were playing straight into the paradigm of a previous age. And I'll be damned if I let these neo-pagan LARPers condemn us to another thousand years of darkness. Well, that's actually uh, that's actually something that I, I wrote about. No, not at all. Sorry, I just forgot that I had myself muted, but that's something that I wrote about in a, in a subsect piece you know, called Cowboys and Indians, where I sort of made that point, that there are, are pre-existing, it, it's sort of like, you know, the old Wile E. Coyote cartoons, you know, where you come across an X painted in the desert, you know, when you stand on the X, you look up and you see, well, well, someone's pushed an anvil off a cliff, you know, targeted directly on the X. And I think that it's actually part of the reason I don't consider myself a Christian nationalist is I look at that term as one that is sort of set up to fail. 
And don't get me wrong, I like those guys. I think they're kind of pushing in the right direction. But I do think that there is something to be said for not being the enemy they want to fight. You know, you see this in kind of tactically who gets boosted. Like, I can't remember the name of the weird neo-Nazi LARPers in the U.S. I think it's called like Blood Tribe or something. They get rolled out every once in a while and they they glow. They glow from a mile away. And <laughs> I, obviously that doesn't mean that they necessarily have to actually be, you know, federal agents. But if you go back into the history of, you know, right-wing movements in the U.S., like look up look up what PatCon is. You know, it's the series of of government infiltrations going on in the eighties and nineties. And like many government programs, we promise we don't do it anymore. Guys is sort of their line on it. But you know, when you look at how you know violent white supremacist groups, and I am not a violent white supremacist, nor should you be. But in the eighties and nineties, these organizations were basically set up to be used in certain operations. They were the enemies they wanted to fight. You know, it's like the, I think it was the Aryan Republican Army was one of them, the ARA. Yes, the ARA. Connected to, yeah. the, to the, McVeigh was a member and a few other people, allegedly. Yes, uh, and and the McVeigh other was literally the only guy at OKC. Okay uh, exactly. That's my, and that's my point in that, right, is that very often, you know, the enemies that they like to fight, either they, they serve their interests because they're on the payroll or they serve their interests because they boister their, their narrative. You know, and when you look at, you know, the 90s, the big push from, you know, the ATF and the IRS to go after, you know, right wing institutions, they used the headline of the ARA, they used the headline of Waco. And let's be honest, we all know Waco is a little bit different than how it was sold. But what did they do? In fact, well, they went after the Tea Party, I realized that's a little bit later, but they went after the militia movement, they went after well, people who right who had actually not done anything wrong or illegal under a previous existing order, but they wanted to get rid of them under the cover of, you know, wanting to go after people like the ARA and wanting to go after people like the order who did that series of bank robbings in the eighties. Sorry, this is a rant for another time, but you're hundred percent right, man. <laughs> no, 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 you're entirely right. And I guess that brings us to Yavin. You don't confront the spirit of the age by fighting it directly. This is riding the tiger. You confront it by transcending it. You don't take up arms and pitch battles and black suns, for goodness sake, and go against the regime. It's something that is singularly designed since 1947 to crush exactly what that is. You use these tools of irony to operate outside of it. And the other point that Yarvin made very dutifully is when you do this, don't cock it up because you may not get another shot. Remember the Bundy Ranch? This whole thing of, um, you know, the, the what was it? The Bureau of Land Management came together and because of the protection of a certain species of desert tortoise, they essentially had this large holdout. Of course, the American listeners will know a lot more about this than the Australian ones. Um, this idea of like, oh, look, they made them back down. They made them back down. They absolutely got them. Uh, no, they didn't. They, 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 they went away, uh, and then they were arrested in the middle of the night. That's exactly how that happened. Just because they didn't turn things to a blaze of glory and gunfire. And I understand the masculine desire to die amongst the storm of steel and shot. But that is not. That is not how you deal with such... Like it's perfect, right? Perfect, such right. An obstacle. Well, and this is something that I, because you may sound like we're, we're contradicting ourselves earlier saying, you know, don't give up. And in this case, you know, don't give them what they want. My answer to that is that obviously, you know, the situation you're, you're placed in a place like the Alamo is very different from the one that the Bundys were in or the one that the regime wants to put you in. You know, it's a different type of opposition. And so essentially your, your goal is to keep resisting and keep alive another day. You know, because one of the things that we're facing is that our enemies are getting weaker over time, you know, which is, which basically means that your goal is to outlast them. You know, it's just one of the things I think, because yeah. I, I do, on, on its face, that may seem to be a contradiction, but I don't see there to be one. But anyway, James, this has been a very enjoyable conversation, but but we're out of time. If people want to check out your writings, obviously you have a sub stack. And uh, really, I enjoyed talking with you quite a bit, man. Oh, no, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. You can find me on Substack at Agricola James. 
If you are an Australian, for goodness sake, find me on Telegram. We can't be sitting around with our dicks in our hands waiting for Caesar to arrive. The upside down Caesar, that is. <laughs> Caesar's got his ground rope on. And Anyway, sorry. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. This is a serious podcast, I promise, guys. Anyway, if you want to support my show, you can do that by finding it on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you want to listen to it. I invite you to please check out my Substack. I've been writing a lot and really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. I'm almost to 500 free subs on Substack, which is a pretty big, pretty big barrier. In general, I do almost all of my posts for free. You don't have to pay me for them. But if you want to support me directly there, I would appreciate it. You can also check out our sponsor, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching. JD is an absolute unit and genuinely intimidating guy. And to be yeah, honest, I think, fat. yeah, stop being fat. And let's be honest. I think that, uh, if, if I ever did make him mad by not sending enough people over to his, uh, over to his app, I don't think I could actually stop him. I think he would just rip me in half like a, like a toothpick. And so, uh, don't let that happen, please guys, please give JD your money. He's, uh, he's a, a very good fellow. Anyway, James, again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And everyone at home, keep your head up. The light can't last forever. Good night.